Good morning, Paul. How are you? I'm fine, thank you, Sean. Great to talk to you. Thank you very much. You, uh, you're a veteran of, of uh, travel and tourism, uh, conservation, sustainable development, an expert on international relations and, and sustainable business practices. When you look at this complex relationship between biodiversity and tourism, and the positives and the negatives on the balance sheet, What's your reflections on the balance that we should be striking? Okay, well, I think, um, to be honest, you know, uh, tourism is, it, I'm a great believer that tourism is a force for good. It can be a massive uh, force for good in building understanding, sharing wealth, reducing poverty, and also it can be a driver of better resource management to uh, protect ha habitats and biodiversity. Unfortunately, our industry doesn't always act like the best corporate citizen. And we have, you know, tales of things like overcrowding and the resulting um, environmental and to some point cultural degradation that that sometimes can bring. But I do believe that tourism and tourists are more aware of their impacts, uh, both environmental and social. And many of them in, in today's world are looking for ways in which um, to either avoid those impacts or in fact to go further and to give something back to the places um, and the communities that they visit. So we've seen the emergence of something called travel with purpose. Uh, this is challenging people uh, to think about why they're traveling and what they want to get out of it. So there's a real opportunity to provide them with an experience rather than just a visit and I think getting them involved on the ground in things like conservation and local community projects is a great way of helping redress the balance um, that tourism brings and there's many innovative companies out there right now doing just that linking the tourist and their money more directly to projects on the ground. So um, I think, you know, growing awareness, making people understand um, how big these impacts are, um, and then finding innovative ways, if you like, to join the dots and to invest back in, in destination habitats and local communities is maybe one way we could go. So, so one of your many previous roles is, is Chief Operating Officer of WWF International. What's your view on the current status of conservation, species loss, and, and global efforts? And, and how do you think COVID-19 has changed that? Okay. I mean, look, I, you know, when we talk about biodiversity, I think we really have to take a, a step back and understand the scale of the problem. Um, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the almost unnoticed um, uh, change that's going on. Everybody's talking about climate change. Uh, fewer people are talking about biodiversity loss. But if you look at the statistics and what science is saying, you know, many scientists are saying that we're on the cusp of a sixth mass extinction. Uh, we've had five in the past, including the one that wiped out the dinosaurs. The difference this time is that that extinction is largely being caused by human activity. And it's not just the sort of the charismatic, you know, what are called megafauna, you know, the elephants, the rhinos, the tigers, those sorts of things. I think by far the more worrying um, uh, change is what's happening to the plant and insect um, uh, uh, species on this planet that are being wiped out through overuse of herbicides and insecticides and the potential and I think scientists are getting more and more concerned about this the potential impact that that, that will have on food supplies and potentially also med medical supplies because we rely on many of those things uh, to provide us with the things that we take for granted on a day-to-day -day basis so there is a huge um, a huge challenge. I think you know tourism um, is is a contributor to that, um, a relatively small one, I would say, compared to some of the other things. But you know the things like uh, poor waste management, the um, appearance of more and more plastic waste in the environment, etc. You know the impacts of that on tourism, if we can't fix it, are going to be huge. You don't want to go to a, an exotic location, sit on the beach amongst um, discarded plastic bottles, or even at the moment, 
um, medical masks that people have been using to protect themselves against COVID. So there is um, a lot that needs to be do be done. I mean, so if you look at it on the surface, the the picture at the moment I would say is relatively bleak, but there are signs of hope. I mean, I'm naturally an optimist. I do believe that we can actually uh, do something, and I think we've seen some some signs of that. I don't know whether you saw the recent report by. WWF that talked about how the tiger population around the world has actually responded to conservation efforts and we started to see the numbers rise again, which of course is, is a fantastic sign because that relies on, on, on healthy habitats and ecosystems to happen. And I think, you know, even at the, at the, at the moment during this COVID crisis, uh, crisis we've, seen, we've seen some really encouraging signs how biodiversity fights back, how species have actually come into the urban space in a way that they've not done that before because of lower human activity. So yes, I think it's a huge challenge. It's one we need to really face up to because I really think it needs to be uh, raised in the public awareness because at the moment, as I said, everybody's focused on climate change and COVID and not necessarily on biodiversity, but we can't let it be the, you know, the, 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 secret, uh, the secret thing that's happening that at the end of the day is going to have a massive impact on all of us. No, as you say, it's a, it's a second existential crisis and, and while we all rightfully focus on carbon neutrality by 2050, we should be looking also at no more species loss after 2030. Yeah. Um, yeah. So one of the key vectors, uh, the channels uh, for illegal wildlife training is the aviation industry, airports, airlines. You also had a, a recent history in the airline industry. Are we making progress? Is this issue taken seriously by governments, airports and airlines? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think, first of all, it's a massive challenge because we're no longer just talking about, you know, the odd tourist taking home a souvenir without really realizing what they were doing and the impact that we're having. We're talking now about organized crime on a global scale. I mean, the, the, the impacts are massive. And unfortunately, some of those criminals do use aviation as their means of transporting their illegally killed wildlife to uh, to market. So this is an issue that the industry became acutely aware of, I think back in 2015, um, and uh, work started to try and understand and scope out the issue. It's not a universal issue. Um, you know, you have to look at the trade routes that people are using from places like Africa and South America towards Asia, etc., and take action on that. We were very fortunate in having some, if you like, uh, leadership uh, that emerged because Prince William of Wales took this issue on and he established back in 2016 uh, what was called the United for Wildlife Task Force um, which um, representatives from the aviation industry were more than happy to join and that resulted in what was called the Buckingham Palace Declaration uh, which has now been signed by 61 airlines around the world and in total over 170 uh, different organizations. But that's only the sort of, you know, the beginning of, of, of the piece. The real recognition was that we had to raise awareness in people working on the ground and in the air of these, of these um, traffickers and, and the tactics that they were using to get their, to get their goods um, to market. So um, it was, you know, at the end of the day, it's not up to airline and airport staff to be law enforcers. So we had to engage with law enforcement, with the World Customs Organization, and took, take guidance as well from the Convention on the International Trade in, in Endangered Species, CITES, on what the right sort of standards would be. And what that's resulted in is a massive training program uh, and the provision of resources to airline and airport staff, um, raising their awareness, making sure that if they see something suspicious, that they know exactly who to go to and get those people then to intervene and take action. And that is, is having some uh, impact around, around the world. And we focus very much on um, key hubs, places like uh, Johannesburg, Nairobi, Bangkok, um, who are the, where are the key hubs for the, the transit of, of some of these, these materials. And also then raising awareness in the eyes of the traveling public that they shouldn't be buying souvenirs um, that have been illegally sourced in this way. 
So again, it's a huge problem. You're up against organized pro uh, crime. There, you know, there are many billions of dollars involved in this trade. And so it's not easy to eradicate. But, um, you know, the industry, I think the aviation industry really rose to the challenge and is trying to do the right thing. And even the US government through the USAID program has been funding um, a program called Roots, which is basically aimed at training um, all of those actors um, that, that we mentioned along the potential supply chain to raise um, their ability to uh, spot and then intervene to actually try and eradicate what at the end of the day is a horrific, uh, horrific trade. So as we translate what scientists tell us into, into policy and into practical actions. Yeah. Um, I, I think you've mentioned a couple of green shoots and, and really positive stories. What yeah. more do you think the travel and tourism industry can do? What are we still missing? And what would be your elevated pitch to, to governments and to industry in 20 seconds each? I think quite honestly, um, we need to understand that the tourist of today is changing. There's a greater expectation that travel and tourism companies, whether that's accommodation, transport or tour operators, do the right thing. People understand um, environmental impacts, they understand cultural uh, degradation, so they want to make sure that that's not happening. That's a massive opportunity for this industry to get it right and to offer products and services that are really going to resonate with today's consumers and have a positive impact at the end of the day. So, you know, we've seen things um, being introduced like um, a better understanding of what's called payment for ecosystem services. So getting tourists to actually make a contribution that goes directly um, to support some of the activities that they're looking at. The best example I can give you is Rwanda, where people are lining up to pay 1,500 US dollars it's not a small amount of money uh, for a license to be able to track and, and, and spend time with mountain gorillas. Now, I think that's worth every penny, but that's a good example. That money flows back to the local community. The local community recognizes the value then of the wildlife and the habitats that they've got, and therefore they're more inclined to want to protect it and to eradicate poaching, etc. So you know, there are many ways in which you can do that. Using tourism as a, as a force for good, as I mentioned before, um, and investing back into those things. And there are some really good and exciting companies out there right now that are offering those types of activities uh, rather than just uh, lay around the pool and get a suntan. Well, we hope to have a number of conversations of some of these product owners looking at the new business models, new funding models, the new partnership models out there, and especially also those that, that place the tourist, the traveler, and local communities at the center of, of, of dealing with this, because that's the big impact. Um, we, must, we must address the environmental issues, uh, rebalance nature in business, but also keep people at the center of this. So thank yeah. you very much for your time this morning. Much appreciated, and uh, we'll You're speak welcome. again. Okay, thank you, Sean. Thank you, Paul.